Hi folks, um, yeah, that's me, Chris Rattel. Uh I'm here to talk about my adventures, trials, and tribulations making an audio library uh, in Elixir. Right now, I looked around and I was like, hey, I wanna make noise with Elixir, um, other than just swearing at the compiler, IEX, and Dialyzer. So, uh, you know, again, why are we here? Uh, we're here, make some noise. Um, hopefully, you're gonna learn at least six things in the next 30 minutes. That's like a new thing every five minutes. So like it's, that's a pretty good bang for your buck, hopefully. Um, we're going to be focusing on majorly three areas. We're gonna be focusing on audio library stuff. So some fundamentals of audio libraries, some kind of survey of the options out there if you decide to implement any of this stuff. We're gonna be focusing on API design. Honestly, like kind of backdoor, that's like the real purpose of some of this talk is the decisions that go into shaping this API, especially when you're doing language bindings and interfacing with other sorts of code. And also, we're gonna be talking about why you're probably here, ZIG integration. So actually, how do we interrupt with ZIG and how do we talk with our libraries? Uh, before I start any of this though, I wanna make sure that I'm acknowledging the folks that kind of got me here. Um, this entire talk would not exist were it not for Isaac's help. Um, Isaac generously paired with me a couple of times when I got stuck, he was just a very, very supportive. Um, an old friend of mine, Squirrel, kind of planted the seeds in my brain for this a while ago. So I also would like to thank both of these folks for a lot of the zig code that, you know, at the very bottom of the stack this library relies on. So um, David is the author of the min audio li mini audio library that we're gonna be talking about later in this. And that's a big C library that handles all of this cross-platform audio stuff. Um, as a quick show of hands, who has tried to do audio like at the low level on machines before? Yeah, okay, so it's, it's quite miserable, right? Um, especially if you want to do it on Linux and Windows and OS X and, you know, an Arduino or whatever. Uh, so the, the fact that David has put this out there in the world is just a tremendous thing. Um, and I'm probably going to mispronounce this, but uh, Michael uh, is doing the Zig Game Dev repository. And inside of that was the set of Zig bindings for MIDI-audio that I ultimately settled on. So again, I just wanted to recognize these folks for contributing and building the software that then I can build on and present on. Um, you know, at the end of the day, like all of us stand on somebody else's shoulders and I think it's important to, you know, recognize and, and give credit to those people. So uh, we're going to kind of chunk this into basically two big parts. We're going to talk about the API part and then we're going to be talking about how we actually build the zig bit. So our first part, our design question, we would like Elixir to make noise probably for game development. Um, overall, I have been kind of looking at Elixir for game development just as like, it sure would be a neat thing. Um, with Scenic, Scenic helps us get like stuff moving on screen, but there is no Scenic for audio quite yet. So when we unpack that though, like what do we wanna do? We wanna be able to say audio play sound, you know, sounds honk dot wave. Like, like that, that, that should be it, right? Like we just wanna make some noise, you, do, you have a module, you call a function, you pass it an argument, right? Like FMA and like a noise happens, this is great. Uh, well, I like this. I, I think it's great, especially for a conference talk, implement one function in a module. What could go wrong? Um, <laughs> I should probably talk to the professionals. So I'm on Twitter where you get, maybe not all of your good ideas, but some of your, well, I was on Twitter and uh, I reached out to my uh, colleague Squirrel and he basically was nice enough just to give me the napkin sketch of a reasonable audio API. And what that means is you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna wanna load a sound. You're gonna want to play that sound, loop that sound. You're going to wanna be able to you know, turn off the sound so it's not just sitting there gibbering at you like all day. You're gonna wanna go ahead and be able to set the volume on that sound to kind of quiet it down or make it louder. You're gonna wanna set the panning so you know, shove it to either side of your presentation space. And then you're gonna to wanna to be able to check if it's playing and you're gonna to wanna to be able to pitch bend the sound. So set the frequency. And, oh, 
all of a sudden that nice little tiny function that was like really great for like a, you know, a really easy conference talk turned into way more than that. So kind of again, stepping through that, in case we want to look at that API a bit more, right? We're gonna say a sound is the thing that's loaded in and a channel is the instance of it. In the simple audio terminology, so simple audio is the kind of name of this kind of spike library. Uh, we have a sound resource instead of a sound here. Instead of a channel, we call it a sound instance, right? Because a playing sound is an instance of a sound resource. The idea being that if you have like 12 different piano keys or something, um, and you want to play each one at a different pitch, you want them to share the same memory or share the same stuff instead of having to load this sound 12 different times. Uh, panning is again, you know, we want to be able to set left and right. If you have a more complicated setup, let's say that you've got like 5-1 Dolby in your, you know, in, in your swimming pool and you really just want to like jam out and have it you know, front and back and the whole thing, um, panning becomes more complicated. That's actually when you get into something called spatialization and that's when you have in your API the opportunity to model, you know, where is the sound in 3D space? What speed is it going if you want to model Doppler? What is the cone of sound? Because some, sometimes you want to kind of fudge it a little bit and pretend that it's only audible in certain directions. And then you also have to model the listeners. So you have this thing called a um, HR, HRF, HRTF, uh, head related transfer function, I think it is. And the idea is, you know, you're simulating the left ear and the right ear. So if any of y'all listen to like, those really nice ASMR videos um, or whatever, right? That's, that's kind of like the things that your audio library has to take care of. Once you start doing that, your API complexity just kind of blows up. So we, we punted on that. Um, and then again, frequency in our case. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll be honest, like choosing not to do something is a great alternative to failure. Uh, it's a viable coping strategy. <laughs> so <laughs> frequency is kind of our multiplier for how, how quickly the sound goes. Um, I should have written pitch bend, but it's basically the idea between if you're playing something and you want it to come out sounding like, I don't know, Barry Manlow or Alvin Chipmunk. So for the, for the same sound instance. Um, so we go ahead and we say, hey, I wanna actually create sounds in Elixir. Cool, what do you do? You go into hex.pm and you're like, audio, boop. What does it give back? Well, you get membrane. Membrane is awesome. Membrane has a lot of really, really cool features around streaming media, audio, video, fan out, like all kinds of cool stuff. But like, again, I just wanted to play a sound. Like, that's, that's, there's a lot of tooling. I don't want to know all that tooling. Uh, there's something called Heavy. As far as I can tell, OSX only. Um, it has no docs and I'm like, it might be abandoned. Um, and then there's Earl Audio, which also has no docs. And it's eight years old, but it's written in Erlang, so I still trust it. But like, <laughs> Again, it might also be abandoned. So I said, all right, well, fine. Uh, not fine, I didn't use the words fine. Uh, let's build a new one. I like adventures. So we're gonna need to call out to native code, right? At, the, at this time, there's not really a convenient way of just having Elixir, like in the standard library, it's gonna be very difficult to convince Jose that we need audio in the standard library. So what are our options? We can use ports. This isn't a terrible idea. But we're still gonna have to write both sides of that. We're still gonna have to write like a C application or a whatever application that's gonna sit there and get spun up and you know, mentored and managed by Elixir in the Erlang runtime. I still have to write an application in C. That's not really what I wanna do with my life. Um, we could go ahead and use like a C or a Java node. Okay, now I've increased this to writing C or Java. Great, that's, that's cool. Again, it'll work. Not actually what I wanna do. Um, we could use HTML5 and live view Phoenix plug and we'll just cram the whole thing in a web view and you can load like 100 megabyte executable to play a honk. <laughs> no. So we're gonna write an if. And what are our options? So we've, we've decided to go the, the annoying route of writing an if. Well, are we gonna just directly like open up the docs for our respective platforms. No, 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 we're gonna use a library. We're gonna find somebody, some work that somebody else has put forth into this world, and we're gonna use that. So our options there are SDL audio, which comes with, uh, who here has ever used SDL or heard of SDL? Okay, so it's, uh, I think it's technically like the simple direct media layer or something. It's great for game development. It's great for any type of cross-platform app where you have like a screen, you're basically ignoring any of the windowing system or any of this, and you just need to pull in in a, OS agnostic way, 
mouse events, keyboard events, joystick events, gamepad events, audio stuff, networking stuff. It's even got threading primitives if you know you're that far into the hole. Um, it's it's quite a nice library, but it's it's a lot. Um, we have FMOD. This is a company that's been around for a long time, and they have spent like bajillions of engineer hours making frankly, a just delightful API to work with that has a lot of those bells and whistles in terms of spatialization and having like programmatic and dynamic music and just all kinds of things. But again, that's like way too much. We have port audio, which is kind of on the other end of the spectrum. It's like, you know, hi, I'm here, I'm Linux, give me a pile of bytes at the appointed times and I will like play them over your speakers. Okay, okay, it doesn't really solve the problems I want just yet. Um, and then there's mini audio and mini audio is, uh, a relatively recent project in the mold of singer, the, the, the single header kind of indie game dev like um, home. Have you all ever heard of like, I think it's like Homemade Hero or like something like this? Anyway, it's this whole movement in indie game dev to build like small, you know, we're, gonna, we're not gonna use Unity. We're not gonna use Unreal. We're gonna build our own stuff. It's gonna be great. We're gonna go uphill both ways in the snow and everyone's gonna love us and shower us with millions of dollars of game developer money. That's not what happens. Except when it does, that's why it's such a trap. Anyway, so <laughs> this aside aside, um, we like this library. It's gonna be relatively easy to work with. It's cross-platform, it handles file loading, it handles on, like encoding stuff, and it's got a relatively sane framework. And critically, other people have built cool stuff with it. So before we dive any further, I would be amiss in having an audio talk without some actual talk about audio. So the idea that audio works on a computer, we're gonna start at your ears and kind of work our way backwards. Um, the step I'm omitting here is like, you know, at the very thing, at the, at the very top of the stack, your brain interprets some like neurons and it's like, ooh, I got a neuron and that sounds like a honk. And then like the neuron is triggered by your the cochlear in your ear, which has like a little strand that waves because of pressure and vibrations. We're, we're gonna skip that part and make it a slide. The pressure and vibrations come from a speaker. That speaker is driven by a voltage signal that tells it to suck or blow harder or softer. And that will, you know, wiggle, 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 creates a pressure wave. That signal came from what's known as a digital analog converter. Um, as the analog side you know, works back to the digital side, that's where your computer comes in. Um, the DAC reads off of a pile of values. So basically just think of a, you know, it's a list of numbers. The buffer is in turn, those list of numbers come in chunks. The chunks have a sample rate in numbers of samples per second. So the idea is that you're gonna say, hey, I have one second of a honk. It is recorded at, oh, I don't know, purely random number, 44.1 kilohertz. And I'm gonna have that many samples to just describe this beautiful little waveform of a honk. Um, we have this idea of a bit rate, which is the number of bits per second. So you know how many samples you have, but then you also have the number of you know, uh, thresholds in that sample. So you have the imagine of you know, full off and full on. So that's like a one bit sample, right? On or off, not terribly great. Uh, sounds like your average, you know, flash video circa like 2008. Um, you have increasing numbers of samples until you get up to what we'd call like CD audio, which is I think like 16 bits. So that's like 65,000 and change different threshold values. And when you kind of combine those things together, um, you can actually figure out like how much space uh, in memory you're gonna be taking up to create a certain amount of sound. So human hearing is between 20 and 20 kilohertz. Um, we have this thing called the Nyquist rate because you can't talk about audio with a kind of touching on DSP. So surprise, you're gonna learn a little bit of digital signal processing today. It's the tiniest bit. Um, and this is the minimum frequency that you must sample of a signal to represent it accurately. This is because of a bunch of very clever math decades ago. Um, we know that that's twice the frequency of the signal. So if I have a one kilohertz sine wave, I need two kilohertz of samples. So if you don't have that, you get something called aliasing. And this is a delightful picture I found that kind of describes this problem where if you are sampling it at like not twice the frequency, you say, okay, I'm gonna start at the beginning and the, the signal is zero. Great. Um, and I'm gonna go a little bit further, but like not far enough to capture it fully. I'm gonna take another sample. And if I just am unlucky enough, I will reconstruct a signal that is much slower or in some cases much higher pitched than the signal I'm looking for. So. A little bit there. Um, so for our purposes, we care about 40 kilohertz. Usually this is 44.1 kilohertz. Um, in strict usage, if somebody talks about the bit rate, we think of samples per second 
times the bits per sample times the number of channels per sample. Stereo audio has two channels, right? Left and right. 5.1 has, I guess, six channels. And it's, you can think of channels kind of like the color planes in an image. So you have like, you know, the red channel, the green channel, the blue channel, the alpha channel. Um, in some other color spaces or more advanced <laughs> image formats, you might have yet like still other channels. Um, for our purposes for game development, we care about two channels. Um, you might ask, but hey, Chris, what about my crazy 4323 bit arbitrary, like, like arbitrarily sourced like Flak Vorbis great thing that I got? I'm like, well, I mean, so, so the reason you're getting this weird number on that is because that's also taking into account the compression stuff. And that can, again, like some of these words, and you're going to run into this both in this talk and other places, some of these words are kind of overloaded. So you're going to see them in multiple contexts, and you're going to say, wait, like channel, source, like that means different things in different places. So just something about that. Also note that because we talked about different compression causing different bit rates, that implies we're going to encounter multiple file formats. So when we're tying this all the way back to actually writing code, when we're picturing which library that we want to be using, we want one that can handle different file formats. So um, back to the matter at hand. So we want a library that can load files and decode them. That's kind of what all that was leading up to. We would like it to be easily callable as a NIF. It shouldn't have a whole bunch of setup and you know, all the other stuff. And we want it to be able to talk to the hardware and play the buffers. So what we don't want to do is have a library that loads a file and then have a different library that actually handles like combining different buffers and things, and then a third library that handles actually playing it over a speaker. We really just want one library to solve all those problems. Um, as far as actually interfacing with those libraries, we have C, Rust, and Zig right now. Um, I know C. I would prefer not to write C if I can avoid it. Um, I've heard great things about Rustler. I have done like one thing in Rust. I was like, mm, I don't know, kind of lukewarm on it. Uh, Zig was kind of neat. I've played with it a little bit, played with it more during this. I, I dig it. Um, we could technically also use libraries that I think you could probably shoehorn or strong arm Julia or Fortran or whatever into acting as a NIF. I'm sure there's a talk out there about like, I can't believe it's not, you know, Erlang.h. Um, this is not that talk. If somebody would like to show me how to do like call Ada from Erlang as a NIF, like that would be fascinating, but that's not, that's not where I'm at today. So um, another part of the puzzle, and this is where we're getting more to the actual integration part of our talk. So whatever we need, we're, we're going to have to build it, right? And most of these libraries are either going to show up as a C or a C++ header, and they're going to show up as an object file, so like a .lib file or a .a file or something on Linux. And we also know that whatever our build process is, we're going to have to handle like actually calling out and linking. And one of the great unsung things that like Ziggler handles for us is it actually manages the build tool chain for pulling in these different libraries. And we'll touch on that in a little bit later. If you do this yourself using Erlang NIFs, uh, like, like Erlang or Erl.h, or I forget the name offhand for it, um, you are still going to have to go fight it out with CMake or Make or whatever your build system of choice is. Um, if you pick a language like C++ to, you know, if you grab a library from the C++ ecosystem that doesn't export a nice C API, then you're going to have to wrap that again yourself. So this is another, you know, another design consideration we have to have as engineers is what sort of mess are we looking at from a build standpoint? Um, and again, like if we have a library that has a lot of header files instead of just like one header file, like is common in like kind of like the handmade hero sense, um, then, you know, our life just gets harder. So again, modest preference for libraries that have only one header, mini audio. Um, we're going to choose Zig because we like Zig, and we're going to use mini audio because it ticks those boxes. So we're going to write a ZIF. Um, it's a Zig. Zip. See what I did there? Right, right. No, no, I'll take the applause. I'll take the applause. <laughs> okay, so um, now we're going to take off every Zig. So this is when we actually are going to be showing some Zig code. Uh, so. My general approach to this kind of thing is you write the API and you write your type specs. Um, your mileage may vary, but write the type specs. We're going to kind of spike out that to make sure that it even works. And then we're going to finally actually write the code and then do our wrap up in terms of like elixir quality of life things. So um, first thing we have here is this is, this is our, our, our core behavior, right? So this is our, our little behavior module. We're going to have these callbacks that describe you know, initializing, shutting down. Um, we're going to be doing, you know, kind of, kind of what you would expect from that initial API sketch. Now, the thing is, 
Um, yeah, we're going to talk about ogre engineering here. So let's go back to this. <laughs> so things that are wrong about this. Um, there's like no comments, so that's, that's rubbish, right? Um, next one is that we have init and shutdown. And one of the things we're going to run into later in Zig is when you're, when you're interacting with a C API, it's like driving a manual transmission. Like, you know, I'm going to start the thing, I'm going to put in the clutch, I'm going to initialize the system, I'm going to hit the gas, hopefully not crash, lol. And then I'm going to you know, put in the clutch and shut it down. And it's, and you, it's, it's very much like kerchunk, kerchunk. And um, I don't know, garbage collected languages are a thing. It kind of seems weird that we have to worry about that in, the year over, you know, in, in this current year. So one of the first things to go, and like Isaac actually kind of pushed back on this and was very helpful in, in helping me see the light, was replacing this like manual init shutdown lifecycle management nonsense with actually hooking the language you know, affordances correctly and getting it to take care of it for us. So shutdown went away. Um, next, I looked at it and when I first worked on this, I was like, oh, it's gonna be great. We're gonna have like, you know, your single, you know, simple, like simple audio module, and then that's gonna be your API for it. And we're gonna have pluggable backends. And I, I pulled up the swoosh source code. It's like, oh, we're gonna make it so you can have multiple little apps. We're gonna name it in the config file. It's gonna be real cool. And I was like, Chris, you're, you're, you're overdoing it, dude. We just, we just wanna honk. Why well, you gotta make this weird? So I was like, all right, all right. So we're gonna throw away all that stuff and we're gonna throw away um, the behavior stuff. And so the current version of Simple Audio on GitHub, uh, it's, it's like one module and some zig. There you go. And if somebody uh, more ambitious or spry than I would like to go in and make pluggable backends for different languages, if you wanna have like a Rustler backend instead of a zig back end, Ziggler backend, knock yourself out. PR is accepted. Um, so one place that I actually don't believe is over engineering is before, before we actually start worrying about talking down into the code, um, you want to really clarify in your brain what sorts of data is going to be moving around, right? Like, show me your charts. I won't know what's going on. Show me your data structures. Everything will be fine. Same sort of thing. So this is an example. So we have this idea of like a sound resource, and then it is going to show up, and you can pass it as a you know, file given a path. The idea being that later we would have like, you know, an in-memory blob given an in-memory blob. Wait, cool. Didn't get that far. But, you know, the, the kind of rough hook is there. Um, the other thing that we're doing is we, uh, I, don't, I don't have it on this slide, but um, I, I'm a big fan. Who here has ever used the at opaque in type specs? All right, yeah, so um, you should use at opaque for certain types of things. Um, in our case, and I, I should have used, included this here, we get references back to things. And what we don't want dialyzer and users to necessarily do is like know internally how we're representing things, especially because we're talking to NIFs and we don't want to, uh, we're talking to ZIFs and we don't want to be exposing lots of these details. So we use at opaque, uh, at opaque to signal that this, you know, this is a type and it is okay for the user to pass it into functions and receive it from functions. But like, if you're trying to do anything more complicated than that, then like dialyzer should like wrap them on the wrists for it. And that's, that's what that's uh, useful for. So let's walk through the implementation of init and load. Um, all of the other functions, you know, set volume, set panning, et cetera, basically the same sort of thing. So again, we start out by stubbing in our behavior in Elixir. And this is kind of always my, start, my starting point. I just want to see what the module feels like and maybe play with, some, play with it in IEX. If it doesn't pass the comfortable in IEX test, then I know I'm doing something wrong. So in this case, again, it's a type spec. It's in it, and it immediately just says, yo, it's not implemented yet. All right, cool. Then we're going to go ahead and we're going to step in our zig module. So this is your zig module. Everything should be fine. What could go horribly, horribly wrong? Um, actually, not a lot, but uh, to, to the best of my recollection, working on this as of Ziggler uh, 091, if you have an empty uh, x empty module for uh, the compiler, it will complain at you and say, "Hey, you promised me Zig. There's no Zig." Blah, table flip. All right. Well, okay. We'll, we'll give it some more Zig. It'll it'll cheer up. So then, what we're going to do is we're going to link in Z Audio. So Z Audio is the audio bindings from um, that Zig Game Dev project that handle. Uh, the actual talking to mini audio. Now the trick here is that mini audio is a header file. You can't just really use and create a program artifact from a header file and see because reasons. Um, the reason is the C preprocessor is really, really, uh, it likes strings and not a lot else. So you need to create a C file that includes the header file and then that will get created in translation unit and actually turned into an artifact that it can then get linked with. So in Ziggler, we can go ahead and we can say, hey, 
Here are the source files that you also need to include as part of this process. So we are going to include miniaudio.c, and then we're going to pass actually a bunch of preprocessor defines. So this is actually tremendously helpful. You can set preprocessor defines in Ziggler for when you do your build. And then we are also going to include this thing called cabby uh, workarounds. So I thought it was cabby and I was like, well, what's wrong? Like, is this like a really like pro, pro Uber person or like what's going on? No, no, it's, it's C-A-B-I, so like the application binary interface. So if you're wondering why it's called cabby, that's why. Um, I just misread it for like a week and that has baffled me. So um, what this will do is inside the guts of Ziggler, when you run it, um, it actually templates out uh, what's called build.zig. Build.zig is the equivalent of uh, like mix.exs or what have you for the Zig programming language. One of the things that Isaac and I talked about a little bit and that I would love to see in future versions of Ziggler is the ability to manually specify your build.zig or at least import some of the richer build.zigs that are out there. Some of the other audio libraries or other just neat Zig libraries that we would love to see in Elixir they come with complicated build zigs. So there's not really an easy way to kind of shoehorn sure enough to get it. So in the future, um, and, and this is again why we like the single header file, single C file approach. It plays very well with our build pipeline. So then we can, now we're actually gonna write some zig. Now the first thing I wanna warn you, um, I'm not very good at zig. I'm terrible at zig. I have a coworker, Matt, who's brilliant, um, and he probably would, would see this later and like, go oh, Chris, what are you doing? But it works. So <laughs> it's kind of my MO. <laughs> it's like, hey, it works. We'll, we'll clean it up in post. Um, so th this, is, this is a representative function. Um, this is create engine. You'll notice create engine wasn't on our callback list, and you'll, you'll see why later. Um, we declare it as a NIF with zero arity. We're going to go ahead, and it takes this uh, env beam.env. The, the syntax for zig kind of feels to me like something between go and c, and like I'm OK with that. but. It can be a little weird to read. And then it's going to return a beam.term. <laughs> that bang in front of the beam.term means that it might throw. Now, you might say to yourself, wait a second, if I can throw exceptions, isn't that a bad thing? Well, yes, it's a bad thing. Um, and unfortunately, in, well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it in Zig, um, we tend to be very explicit. Zig, one of the things that Zig does extremely well, but it's also extremely frustrating, it is very explicit, and it means that all of your memory allocations are very explicit. It means that all of your functions that raise or could raise, it will hit you at every line where you could possibly throw an exception and say, hey, if this could blow up, you're gonna have to handle it. Um, normally, that would be annoying. For our purpose, given the fact that we're running Elixir and Erlings, presumably because we enjoy our machines, not just blowing up for no reason, that's actually a good thing. So um, this goes ahead, and this creates our, uh, it, it passes in our beam.allocator, so that's our allocator from Erlang. So all of the nice allocations in the library are tracked using normal tooling. And then it takes that, wraps it in a resource, and spits it back out. Now you might say, what is this, what is this last part where it says, you know, resource.create, what's an audio engine res? I have no idea what this is. So in the very tail end of the 9.1 manual for Ziggler, um, very quickly, it's like, you should use resources. Resource is a way for Ziggler to wrap things that are managed over in you know, native land or in Zig land, and then just give a handle back to your actual Elixir code. So in this case, we're gonna define uh, this thing called an audio engine res. Um, it's just you know, a pointer to an audio state. And then we're going to define the cleanup function. So we say resource audio re engine res cleanup. This is something that internally Zig will, Ziggler will expand out into all of the bookkeeping required so that when it goes out of scope, it is properly cleaned up for you. And that way you don't have to do shut down or destroy or manually implement all of that stuff. So um, next one is we do this for loading. It's very similar. Um, the main thing I wanna point out that's kind of interesting here is that uh, there's this weird part that says var c path try beam allocator blah. In fact, that's so obnoxious, I'm going to call it out specifically, which is this is the incantation for taking a uh, binary in, Erl uh, in, in Elixir and then turning it into a, a zero to an alternated string for consumption by C APIs. So that's something that was a little bit of a, a, head, uh, like a head scratcher. Um, you get that through beam allocator uh, Alex Sentinel. Uh, Alex Sentinel is a way of saying this is a null terminated thing. Um, there is an impedance mismatch between binaries in, in Elixir and then null terminated strings in C. So if somebody creates a binary with a bunch of nulls in it and hands it to this API, uh, 
you know, good luck. Um, please don't. <laughs> um, and that's that's another polish point, I think, for the next version of Ziggler is we, we might see a little bit more love there. And then finally, again, we take all of this stuff and we're just gonna wrap it in a gen server. So, you know, it's 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 a gen server. Who, who has written a gen server before? All right, yeah, it's a gen server. All right, cool. Uh, but but what you'll see here is again, like this is why we have that create engine stub. So the the kind of punchline here is that you're going to um, be taking the the gnarly stuff in Zig, and then all the ergonomics, all the things that make it you friendly, you want to do that in Elixir. So um, kind of coming up on time here. Uh, if you all would like, I can I can honk for you. Would you would you like me to honk for you? All right, cool. So. What we're going to do is we are going to go ahead. We are going to start ourselves up. Cool. All right. So it says, "Hey, I started. Great. I've got a. I've got a PID. It's globally registered. So at this point, I no longer have to refer to it." Um, we're going to go ahead and we're going to load a resource. Uh, that resource, and we're going to do simple audio dot load, and we're going to load assets. Uh, I think it's goose honk dot wave. And if I do this, it's not going to work because we, we made a promise. We promised this that when we invoked load, it would actually be you know a, a path for a file or something else. Cool. So now we have a resource. Now let's go ahead and make an actual sound with that resource. We might want to make multiple sounds. That's why we kind of separate this into two parts and deviate a little bit from what was uh, sketched out in that original API suggestion from Squirrel. So we're going to instantiate our resource. Okay, so now we're gonna do something that's very important because I don't know how loud this will be. We're going to set the volume. And that is going to take our sound and that is going to, we're gonna, we're gonna be very quiet honking to start with and then work our way up. So one thing to note here, you'll see that I didn't get a copy of the resource back. This is once you're in, unless you're doing something like deliberate, once you're in Ziggler, it's all mutable again. So be careful with this. That's why you really want to have a gen server or something mediating interactions with this API. Because otherwise people will be like, I just set a volume and I got a new thing back. It's like, you didn't get a new thing back, you changed it. This is breaking a cardinal rule of the Erlang runtime system, I am sorry. So um, finally, we're gonna go ahead and we are going to play it. And that was very quiet or my audio doesn't work, one of the two. So um, let's, let's see if this goes up to 11. All right, so let's go ahead and set that at like half volume. Ah. So we can also go ahead and set the panning for this. And so let's, let's throw it over on one side of the room. Ah. And on the other side, hopefully we're wired for stereo. If not, uh, I guess we're wired for mono, that's fine. Um, and then we can pitch bend our goose. So let's set our pitch and let's set that as, let's do like a slow honk. <laughs> so um, yeah, so that's the demo. Uh, closing remarks, and I, I don't know if we have time for questions if you wanna hang around afterwards. So I think that there's a lot of potential here. Um, there's still some like rough edges in working with Zig and Ziggler. One of the biggest things I ran into is you're gonna have to get used to reading source code. The Zig documentation before they hit language version one is, uh, I'll go with Spartan. It's accurate, it's there, it's relatively complete, but until they finish polishing the language to where they want it, they're not gonna try to burn out their developers by forcing them to write docs. I respect that decision. Um, Ziggler is kind of in a similar situation. Also, like Isaac is a one-man wrecking crew, and I'm just happy that it works at all and that he made it. So, like, I'm, I, I am used to reading source code as part of this project. Um, you're gonna have to sometimes track things across Elixir, Ziggler, Zig, and then sometimes all the way down to C. At some points, I had like four different languages, like three or four different projects open, and said, "How is this actually happening?" Um, Last thing I wanna say is that this opens up to our community a whole bunch of interesting possibilities. I use this for audio. There are a lot of really cool things written in the last 40 years in C and C++ that are kind of too annoying for us to use, but like, that's not, a, that's not so much the case anymore. Um, there's things off the top of my head. We could have uh, better OpenGL support instead of having to go through like Wix widgets. We could have better, um, you know, if you're doing a packet capture, libpcap or something like this. 
if you wanted to do computational geometry, uh, Seagal or something, um, there's just a whole bunch of really, really cool things out there that we can start taking advantage of. And hopefully in the next few years, I'll be able to see people giving more talks on you know, things that we have kind of brought over. Um, all right, thank you. <laughs>